So Jarvis, when I saw this question in the pre-brief conversation that we were talking about and, you know, going back and forth, just kind of brainstorming on what we wanted to chat about, I chuckled because I said, you know what? I'm going to defer to JD on the first question. <laughs> and that is, of course, about the Falcons and the job status of Arthur Smith. This is one of those crazy kind of do or die games. Like you never wanted it to come to this, but then you kind of always knew it was going to come to this. Even back in week 12, when both of these teams were battling it out, it was one of those situations where you knew somehow, some way, even when Tampa Bay kind of sprinted a little bit ahead of the Saints, sprinted a little bit ahead of the Falcons and the NFC South, didn't really seem to matter. Didn't really yeah. seem to matter because you knew that somehow, some way, it was coming back to what we have always said from the beginning of the season, it will come down to the last game of the season. And here we are. Saints, yeah. Falcons in New Orleans on Sunday is where it comes, what it comes down to. But now, Jarvis, just because of the stretch that you've seen with the Falcons after the bye, it's now not just about getting into the playoffs or not getting into the playoffs, it's also about Arthur Smith's job status and whether or not this game is going to be impactful and a determining factor of that. Do you feel like this game in and of itself is a determining factor, or do you feel like what are the factors involved in maybe him getting possibly getting the pink slip? To be honest with you, I really feel like Arthur Smith, I mean, Arthur Blank, excuse me, is really taking a close look at these last few games. And, you know, we got the report that he was, quote, unquote, safe more than likely after the win against the Indianapolis Colts. And it was the highest scoring uh, game that they played in all season. And they still came short up short of 30 points, that, which they haven't reached all year, uh, which is an issue when you have the head coach who was also the offensive coordinator. It was the reason why he was hired, because he mm -hmm. had one of the most successful offenses in the NFL and all this stuff, right? But for me, I'm not putting all this on one game. I don't feel like his status should be put into just this these last few games or this last game. And and I know, you know, look at the press conference, you were talking about how we just gotta go out there and win. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, you should have won last you should have won not not last week. That was that was not they were not going to win that game last week. And you know, you should have won. Uh, against, you know, the Carolina Panthers and, you know, just so many things that went into that game and just the, uh, the, the, the being so conservative on offense and just mm -hmm. even in the first drive of, of, of uh, against Chicago, it just, yeah. I question too many things. I question too many things just from a uh, offensive play calling standpoint, because you'll come out with the trick play to open up the game, right? You get some yards, B. John Robinson breaks off a nice long run of doing B. John Robinson type things. You take a shot down the field with Kyle Pitts. If the quarterback makes a little bit be a little bit of a better throw or if Kyle Pitts makes an effort to try to die for the football, when the last time have we seen that? You know, that's a whole nother conversation for, for yeah. another podcast. Like, why is this dude, what has this dude done? You yeah. know, you know, since he's been here. And I know there are other factors that, that come into play, but mm -hmm. he's a part of it too. I, I say that for, for a fact, you know, from, yeah. what, from what I see from my eyes. But I think overall, though, this should not come down to whether or not he win this game what to save his job. Because at the end of the day, if the, if you're bringing it down to – if you're minimizing it to one game, mm -hmm. we're probably going to be in the same situation where you're going to have to be – probably have to fire him the following year just like you did Dan Quinn. Yeah. So I feel like Arthur Blank, regardless of whether or not he doesn't feel like going through another firing of mm -hmm. a regime or whatever – he, he he better better make the right decision on this because if you talking about this regime drafting another quarterback in 2024 I don't trust that they saw with their own eyeballs and said Desmond Ritter is the guy and we know that for a fact that that is he is not the guy he is not QB1 he deserved right. to be in the NFL he could be a solid backup sure. but he is not the guy that, that 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 needs to serve this team where they um currently constructed yeah. And for me, I think mine is probably a little bit more nuanced because on some level, I do agree with you that it should never come down to just one game. But on the same token, you had so many opportunities to make it not come down to just one game and you didn't. 
That's why is that's why we're here now. So I, I want to go back to what you said about the, the Panthers. That could have been a game where clearly we wouldn't be having this conversation because you would have won it and you would have been in a position to where your conference record, excuse me, division record would have been better than the Saints and the Bucks, like straight away, right? Okay, that's mm-hmm. one. Go back to the Cardinals. The Cardinals. And yeah, miss me with the whole, but they beat the Steelers. And well, you know, Steelers are the Steelers are gonna steal and the Cowboys mm-hmm. gonna cowgirl. So miss mm-hmm. me with that. You still were one of the teams that should have, could should have, could have, and would have beaten them, except right. you didn't. So I look at that game. Vikings, winnable. Titans, winnable. I don't give a darn what Will Levis did. Still winnable. So many games, so many opportunities when the Falcons could have won, should have won, but didn't win. So now you have kind of brought it to the last three games. And I think the reason... I don't. And so, like I said, I agree with you. It shouldn't come down to one game, but I think it has come down to one game to save his job. I think at this point, it's more about saving it than losing it, because I think you're probably on the closer end of losing it than you are to saving it. But do well in this game. And that can that might that might buy you something. But then, like you said, Jarvis, if it buys some time for Arthur Smith, meaning time into the next season, then where do you find yourself? Because if you're not careful, and we talked about this two or three weeks ago, it's going to be the Dan Quinn situation all over again, where what, what's going to happen midway through the season, there will be a firing and Ryan Nielsen is going to be the de facto head coach. And then we're going into this circle and this roller coaster again. And it, it's just, yeah. So, and one more thing I wanted to share there before we kind of before I touch base with you on the, on the Cherry Fontenot side of it as well is this. Mm. I think that another kind of challenge there is when you're dealing with, you know, this situation, I wonder to myself and going into the personnel piece, how mm. much of this was Arthur Smith and how much of this was Terry Fontenot? Where I think Terry Fontenot gets saved is all the defensive players that have really stepped up to the plate, the free agents. And now you and I are having more conversations about Zach Harrison and DeMarco Hellams. So to me, he's done his job. Right. I think he's good to go. The question becomes, but who pulled the trigger? Who was the trigger man on that QB1 on Desmond Ritter? Because that might be some things, Jarvis, that maybe we don't find out until after the fact of whatever happens with Arthur Smith. But that one kind of stays on my mind. And that's the that's the issue that I have with this whole combo GM coach thing, like them being on the same plan for they shouldn't because they're two totally separate entities. One has to always be thinking about the future and, 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 and making sure they are, you know, financially set now um, with, with putting a good um, enough talent on the field right now. And they also have to think about the future. OK, am I going to give uh, A.J. Terrell a big boy contract? Arthur Smith shouldn't be having to think about that. He sh- he doesn't think about that, actually. You know, that's up to Terry Fontenot and his staff. So those guys should not be on the same playing field because we get in these gray areas, like Thomas Dimitrov's job was saved because of, oh, yeah, the, what well, they wanted to go with Rasheed Heckman. No, you didn't. No, no. That's your personnel department. Y'all scouted that dude. You yep. can't bring that on Brian Cox because, hey, Brian Cox, bounce for him. That's part of the culture style, so that's on Mike Smith. No, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. So that's why I don't like this whole combo combo uh, situation. So so I feel like it's hard for me to give a coach credit for you know personnel when there is a GM in place. Yeah. And the Patriots, everybody gives Bill Belichick you know the criticism and the praise for putting that team together because he is the de facto general manager for that team. So it's a clear, it's a clear uh, structure as to what's going on. And it's never been clear because Arthur Blank has always done that. And that's why I feel like he's never hired a, a head coach with any experience because uh, any he- head coach with any sense is doesn't want to be tied to a general manager because there are some uh, decisions that have to be made where you say, hey, I'm the general manager. I'm, I want this guy. I like this guy. I feel like he can be this guy. And the coach can say, "Okay, you the personnel decision maker. I'm gonna try to make. I'm gonna try to make it work. Make it work but if yeah. it doesn't, guess who's at fault? The general manager. And we just haven't been able to do that because Arthur Blank always wants to combine these guys and hire them at the same time and all this stuff. You know, even hire Arthur Smith before Terry Fontenot. So it's just yeah. 
It's just it's too much gray area when it comes to this situation, and that's why we always having these conversations about all right, well, who made the decision on Desmond Ritter? Right. Who ain't made the decision on Rasheed Hagman? It's just right. too much. It's just too yeah. much. Yeah, and do they stay? Do they both go? Do they both stay? Now, in this case, you might see an Arthur Smith departure and a Terry Fontenot staying because, like you said, Arthur Smith was hired independently of Terry Fontenot. So it'll right. be interesting how that goes. And just real quick before we wrap up and move on to the next topic, want to give a shout out to the guys that have been consistent because we talk about the fact that the Falcons have been up and down, up and down, up and down this entire season. But one guy on defense has stayed the course. Another guy on offense has stayed the course as well. So we've got to give a shout out to Jesse Bates the third for being selected for the Pro Bowl games coming up in February. Chris Lindstrom gave getting his second now this is jesse bates first not oddly enough well, that was crazy but that that's pretty darn cool and even you know giving a shout out to a keith smith who was named a second alternate young way cool a third alternate and both bajan robinson and drew dalman as fifth alternates now you may laugh and say like why are we talking about fifth alternates because it's still an honor for a rookie to be on that team and it's still an honor for drew dalman to be recognized because we know how challenged the falcons have been at all really i don't want to say all across the o-line but Minus mm. Jake and minus Chris. Right. Everybody else has been a challenge. So for him to even get a nod as a fit alternate still speaks about the progress that's being made under center or at center. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it, it kind of just speaks to where the development piece, right? Like I was never a big fan of Drew Dahlman when he came in, but hey, he's been solid. Cause you're not going to get all pros and pro bowl guys all the way up and down the offensive line. You're going to just have guys who just fit your system and they're going to be, give you exactly what you need. Nothing more, nothing less. And I feel like to be at least in that conversation, you got to look at it and say, Oh, okay. All right. That's fine. You know, but like for a guy like Jesse Bates to be able to get the nod for a pro bowl, I'm assuming that he's going to be in the conversations for all pro as well. And then Chris right. Lindstrom, yeah. ever since he's gotten healthy, you know, he missed three games this year, but you know, for him to kind of be in this space where, um, I'm sorry, like dealing with injuries in, in, in one game, but mm -hmm. you, don't, <clears throat> you only miss, miss, miss one game. I'm sorry. Right. Um, but, but just the way he, the way he looked, you know, out on that screen pass to Tyler Algeria against Chicago Bears, I'm like, yep, that's the Chris Lindstrom that I know. That's the one that I, I, I'm just, and then just cleaning up piles, you know, just going downfield and getting blocks. That's the type of guy. That's why he's a pro bowler. That's why he's the, the guy that I said, okay, yeah, this is this is the guy they need to have in here, and this is the Chris Lindstrom that we're used to. Indeed, indeed. So, yeah, shout out to those guys for keeping it consistent in a very, very inconsistent season for the Falcons. Now, when we come back, guys, we're going to take you around the Metro with some sales that are going on. The drivers and I don't, don't quite understand. 